I'm Matthew Newberger, and I have with me today Fred Dunlop. Fred is not only a friend, but he's somebody that I admire a lot, and he's accomplished a lot. And I'm hoping you're going to get some really fantastic takeaways, not only from his life experiences, some of the things he's accomplished that I think can apply to either how you work, how you manage, own a business, or how you work within a business. Welcome. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. I think your taste is a little shaky if you call me a friend. Other than that. <laughs> I doubt it. It's, it's good company. Uh, one of the things I always say is proximity is power. And some of the off-camera conversations we were having about just options trading, yeah. uh, I have to keep you around the office okay. just to help me with that. I will do it. But um, with that, I want to give you kind of a background on Fred. Some of the facts that are really important that I think uh, are why you need to pay attention to what Fred has to say is Fred uh, joined a company called XL Health after working in big industry and in the healthcare industry specifically, uh, but joined XL Health as a turnaround uh, CEO in 2007-8. I think I got that right. Right at the end of 07. Right at the end of 07. They were about $600 million in revenue at the time? In 2007, 600 million, yeah. Okay, and then at 2012, you had an exit. We and, did. And the revenue was about 2.1 billion. What was the exit price? 2.4. The exit price was 2.4 billion. So up from 200 million. That was a good, good outcome. So I, I, I always welcome people into our office who have had that kind of success. I think that's about a four bagger, but that's or twice. Or <laughs> eight bagger. It's a pretty impressive return. And I think the thing that you can learn from is I always believe you can learn from success. So there's a lot more you do, and I'm gonna, we're going to talk about that sort of on the back end, some of the things you're involved now, working with students and more sure. detail on that, and, and your private equity background. I think those are the things that are really, really kind of important. But um, one of the things I want people to know is, is that you, you are now one of the founders of uh, Guide on Partners. Guide on Partners. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Guidon, just sort of the 30-second version. Sure. Guidon is a private equity company that co-invests with the very large private equity firms. Uh, my partners and I are, are similar backgrounds, worked in, in the healthcare industry, and have all had exit, exit opportunities in the last five years. And this is a way for us to stay close to the industry and also to co-invest with some very large firms. So we've done, just as an example, uh, we've done four deals in the last 18 months, which is pretty active, um, and the market capitalization on those four deals together is about about 1.8 billion. So we're 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 no longer thinking about it. We're actually very involved, and we take executive uh, chairman roles or active active board member roles to help the management team. So serious business, and on the on, on the side, one of the reasons that we started talking specifically having you come in for the interview is your book, which people can find more about at your, at, actually at your website, which is freddunlop.com. That's right. And they can get sort of some background on that. If you're a friend or a client of ours, if you ask me for a copy of that book, we'll provide you with a copy of that book, which is through our special deal with Fred. Special deal. We'll talk more about all of that, your experience in, in, in writing your first book. I think you right. probably have more books in you than that. I do, in the middle of the second one right now. So. <laughs> It'll be a little while before it comes out. All right, so get in line for that one soon, because that I, there's usually more than one book yeah. in the offing when you get the first one started, right? That's, right. That's the first, most painful one. First one's the hardest. <laughs> so we'll talk more about that in a second, but I really want to talk about um, some of the wins you've had, and I want to help the managers and the owners and the entrepreneurs and the salespeople and the project managers, anyone who's watching this, right. who's wondering, you know, I mean, at some point we were both, you know, 20 years old. We didn't know we were kind of talking about this off camera. We it, was, didn't know. it was three years ago. By the way. <laughs> You're right. It was just yesterday. It was. So it seems like it, but one of the things that I think is really important is, is I think a lot of people believe that it's not possible to do something like what you've done. And I think, you know, if you look at the success with XL Health and you coming in and a turnout guy, there was a lot that happened, but you started as a 20 year old yep. cutting grass. Right. And cutting it well, by the way. Really. <laughs> Precise lines. Straight lines, Straight on lines. time, out on time. That's right. Um, but you, you, know, you weren't a guy that people handed you things. You weren't a person that went to, uh, you, you didn't have an MBA. I, I don't think you have an MBA no. now. So no MBA. You're a turnaround expert. You have a private equity group with a bunch of very respectable people. 
and nothing more than an undergraduate degree. And a lot of people would see that as not being a logical path to success. You took a company with $600 million in revenue that wasn't making money, which is the important thing. Revenue is not impressive. Right. Profit is, is, is impressive. And the company wasn't making any money when you came in. Turnaround guys don't come in when things are going like fantastically well. They come in when there's a problem. Yeah, I, that, that's, uh, that's a great lead into it. Excel Health was a, a healthcare service company and the Medicare Advantage company and had 600 million, as Matt said, in revenue in 2007, but was losing 150 million EBITDA. Uh, not a good situation and not one you can leave that way for a long time. And so we came in and had to make some very quick decisions uh, just to stabilize the company. And then over the course of four years, uh, found a way to differentiate our product in such a way, put in, put in uh, business controls that were lacking at the early stages of my time there. Uh, and out of that, we turned not only turned a $600 million company into a $2.1 billion revenue company, which is creating likability and differentiation in products. That was the basis of the, of the uh, improvements that we had revenue-wise. On the EBITDA front, we went from $150 million loss to $260 million in gain, which is a $410 million turnaround of earnings, uh, which is what made us an attractive acquisition target. Getting from cutting grass to something as fun as that. And it was fun. It was fun. Um, it has to be it's, fun. It's, I wouldn't do it if it was that fun. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Yeah. But I want to talk, first of all, the kind of the path to getting there. So talk yeah. about why did you believe in, in going and working at big companies first? Why that when a lot of people are thinking now startups and, and uh, you know, start a business in your garage right. or go work for a small company and get equity. Why, why that path? You know, we talked earlier that there's a tendency now, or I, I, I spend a lot of time, we may get into this a little bit later, but doing seminars for college kids, helping them try to navigate what their future will be after graduation. Yeah. And invariably, I hear more and more, everybody wants to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, and they want to go, right. they, you know, go into a garage with a best friend and start a company. Uh, I didn't go that path, and frankly, the, that path was available back then, but I thought it was important to work in a big company for a couple reasons, and I, I'd hold to it today. When you're 21, 22, 23 years old, or I'll even say 26 years old, there's still so much you haven't learned about business that you can learn working in a large organization. Number one, you're getting paid a salary by them to work for them, but you're getting to learn to boot. And that's different than being in a startup where there's no revenue, no income. And if you can imagine Matt and Fred back when we were 20 and we decided to start a business together, neither one of us has ever been a manager, neither one of us has ever grappled with some of the the more uh, sophisticated parts of business, we're just two idea guys. And so there's a limit to how much we can really grow personally through the time that we do that. All right, and how do you learn just business etiquette? Like how to write an email to somebody that has impact. Right. Uh, how to lead people. Right. Uh, what people respond to and what they don't respond to. How to understand politics and how to navigate politics. If you're in a big company, you understand that. If you're in a small company and you want to become a big company, you better understand it. So talk a little bit about now why PE now. Like you're yeah. you, you've gone through the big company experience, you're a turnaround guy, and now you're helping other companies. So why PE now? Uh, I think because it, after after 20 years working with big companies, I was about uh, 40 when I left big comp big company environment. At that point, I'd had 18 years of time learning my mistakes. And when you make mistakes, everybody does. Making mistakes on someone else's dime is a safer strategy than starting my own business, making a mistake that kills the company. Um, having gone through that kind of tutelage over those years, I thought, you know, it's time for me to go out into the cold world of private equity. And I say cold world because there is no big company to back you up. You have to be the company and you have to set, set the uh, uh, direction and you're accountable to all the, all the consequences, good decisions and bad ones. It goes well, it's fantastic, but it also can be precarious at times. You know, one of the things I like about private equity that I think almost requires you to go through the big company experience first, in private equity, there is very little waste. No, oh, that's, that's the goal. And people get that the, all of the garbage is sort of swept aside and it's either can you do this, can you not do this, yeah. and if you can't, move out of the way right. because someone else is going to do it right now. <laughs> I, have a, I, have a I have a term for that. It's called big company itis. <laughs> having, having worked in big companies, one of, the, one of the beautiful things is not only was I developing, but I had managers and I managed people. And some of the managers I had were great managers and I could learn from them. Other ones were not good managers. I learned from them as well 
about how I would not behave if I was ever in their position. So there's learning in every different direction, but on top of that, big companies, because they're big, can't move as quickly. It's like a, being a barge as opposed to a cigarette boat. Private equity is, requires companies to move briskly, make the kind of quick decisions Matt referred to, and be fiscally conscientious with, with the assets that we have because the clock's ticking. It's all about internal rate of return, and uh, wasted dollar affects negatively the return, the return that you have. And we find any time we're dealing with a, with a PE-backed company, the first question is ROI. Just give us the ROI. Right. And how, what, what's your timing on the ROI? And is it guaranteed? Nothing's guaranteed. <laughs> Nothing's guaranteed. So it's it's what I like is it's so to the point, but you have to be sharp enough to know how it normally works in order to know where you can trim the excess. So it's sort of going from where you started, which was big company, right. to PE now. Let's back into the to the Excel Health. Sure. Uh, tell me a little bit about Excel Health. What was going on when you got there? Well, yeah, I, I had started my own consulting business as a turnaround guy. When I was working with big companies, I ran large divisions, but I oftentimes was given some divisions that were challenging, ones that the, had frustrated the, the senior managers and they couldn't seem to make it grow or couldn't make, couldn't make enough money, and they thought about getting rid of it, and they said, well, you know, before we do that, let's, let's go to this guy Dunlap and see if he can spend some time on it and find a way to bring back some vitality. And my batting average on that was pretty good. So, so with, having that experience made me well positioned for getting out in private equity where sometimes things don't go well and you've got to make quick decisions to, uh, to rectify the situation. So I had built a bit of a reputation for being a turnaround expert and had done a number of different consulting deals where I'd come in to a company that was embattled, yeah. help them stabilize, and, and companies have trouble because they can't grow, they have troubles because they've got a marketing strategy that doesn't work, maybe it's because of leadership, any number of reasons that can draw, can draw a company away from an optimal performance. So in some cases I would come in as the interim CEO, in some cases I'd come in just to help them redesign their entire marketing and sales approach and try and kind of get back to what is it about their product that's differentiating, or if it's not differentiating, what do they have to do to make it make the product have some zip out in the marketplace. So I was doing all of that and, and a private equity firm called Madeline Patterson, who I'd never worked with, had heard about me word of mouth um, and said, you know, we've got a, we've got a problem company and we need, to, we need to have someone come in and do an assessment of it. And that brought me there in November, November 26, 2007. And you know what's interesting is when you're a consultant and you're brought in to help deal with a problem and then you come back and tell them how to fix the problem, they say, you know what, I think we found a good candidate to run the company. Yeah. <laughs> it's you. <laughs> well, and, and I, I was on a 90 day, 90 day run um, doing, and it was literally 90 calendar days. Um, yeah. 12 hours Short a day. Short amount of time. 12 hours a day, every day, um, right through the holiday season. And they decided to remove the CEO and offered me the job. And I, I enjoyed my consulting business. I thanked them very much, but I said no. Um, three weeks went by and they decided that the question should be asked again <laughs> and I said no again and uh, I got to the end of my 90 days and was called in by the partners um, who were facing a need because the company had lost so much money to put another hundred million into the company and the lead partner said we're gonna we're, we're not gonna put the hundred million in because we haven't found a suitable CEO we, we've asked you before if you take the job but you said no, and we respect you for wanting to have your career go the way you want it. Um, but we just need, need to let you know that we're not going to put the hundred million dollars into the company. And if you still don't take the CEO job, we're going to have to wind down the company and put it through bankruptcy. Um, and we need to hire you for another hundred days to manage the bankruptcy process. So that was that was a hard question. Um, I asked them if I could take a half an hour and walk around Madison Avenue in New York. I came back in. And took the job. So that was end of February 2008. Wow. And was it something that was just kind of obvious to you? You took your walk and you're like, you don't have a choice. These are good people. Exactly. It's a good company, that kind of a thing. Yeah. We had at the time about 500 employees who were good people. They weren't, pro all of them weren't properly trained in the things they needed to be trained in. Um, but really there was a lack of strategy and leadership in the company that 
that I thought after 90 days I knew the people well enough that I could possibly resurrect this company. And so the thought was if I don't take the job, 500 people who many of them I've gotten to know quite well and, um, and, and you know, had a lot of respect for their work ethic and their, their, their undying attempt to do the right things and to follow, follow the new strategy. And I realized if I didn't take the job, we'd be, they'd all be out of work. And when you think about it, Matt, you know, with four, you know, four times the number of workers for accounting for their dependents, their family members, you know, it was 2,000 people were hanging on my decision. And so I, I felt compelled to take it. Yeah. A little bit of pressure in the boardroom, huh? It, well, pressure, you know what, it's loyalty. And yeah. you, know, we, you and I have talked about management and management styles. And um, loyalty to me, any great company has incredible loyalty within the organization. And I actually want to talk about how you how you create that in a company, especially one that certainly went through some challenges. So mm -hmm. maybe let's, let's talk a little bit about some, some of the challenges. Sure. And then I think what would be helpful for the listeners is to hear... What was the framework or some of the principles you could give them mm -hmm. that you used to overcome those challenges? So sort of challenges first, the problems, right. and then what were some of the rules, the principles, the methodologies, the belief systems, the things that you put in place that allowed the company to actually write itself? Because we all know that mechanics are one thing, but the psychology of the organization, what, how the leader That's aligns everything. people, it's like everything. And then if you can find the mechanics and get people to do the mechanics, but it's got to be the psychology first. So maybe the challenges first and then maybe the psychology that, that went into it. Sure. Um, I, as I mentioned, I got there in late 2007. I'm walking in and I'm inheriting a company that's losing extensive amounts of money and the clock is ticking because the opportunity to fix it is very time limited. I would say probably a good, a good comparable to that would be if I were a surgeon in an emergency room. So if I'm a surgeon in an emergency room, in comes a gurney with a person critically injured, and I've got to find out a lot of information very, very quickly. I can't just act. I've got to learn. I've got to find out what the, who the patient is, what their background, certain vitals, before I take the steps to try and, and make the, and, and stabilize the patient. Coming into a new company is no different than that. It's very similar. You've got to ask a lot of questions. You've got to show a lot of interest. Frankly, you're coming into a company that's not doing very well, and so some of the people who are giving you answers may be giving you not good answers. And so I found myself asking the same question to a lot of different people and triangulating the results. So out of that, two, a couple things are happening. I think management's all about psychology. I was going and meeting with people, and I wasn't just meeting with people who were my direct reports. I was meeting with their, their people and with their people. This is probably the first time a CEO has ever spent time one-on-one -on -one or one-on-ten with people at these levels in the organization. So let's think about what those people are thinking. They're thinking it's pretty cool that this guy is out here willing to spend time with us. It gets to some of the loyalty things. All right. I also find that the more I can be visible, the more people I'm tangible and people can say it's not this guy that's in the corner and what's he going to do and uh, right. it, there's no phobias because I'm accessible. I think too many managers are not accessible enough. I, I found that, you know, I mentioned I've had some bad managers. There were ones that didn't want to get in the details. They wanted to stay stay above it. You know, the details is where your business is. And now, so, so in turnarounds, you, you got to be in the details. But you have to now, and I and I like and respect what you're doing because I find that the, the best answer comes from the person doing the job, no not the manager managing the person doing the job. Yeah. But at the same point, that creates, I'm sure, a break in the old process. Totally. And so, how does it, how does everybody react to that? Well, that's differentiation, right? Yeah, <laughs> it sure ma is. Management differentiation. The, the person I replaced was, and you know, good person, but totally different style, totally different degree of approachability. Um, I knew that. I, I've always been more the people person, and by doing that, you get people excited. They're like, I'm, I'm actually being asked to be a part of the solution. That engenders a sense of of accountability. That if, if I'm being asked, I'm expected to be part of the solution. Right. You all, all automatically, visually, you're seeing the organization coming closer together. Companies that know more about themselves in a, in a totally sober way um, are the companies that can take actions to make things better that may not be. So was the challenge that people, I mean, if, if the company is losing money at this point, mm -hmm. there, how much of it was just, it was the wrong, they had the wrong model? Versus they had they had people you said you mentioned something about people being properly trained and right. things like that. 
What do you think the top couple of challenges you, you saw as you got in there? The, the, the but, and you were already doing the consulting thing. So really sure. Well, that, that was the beauty of taking the CEO job. Having 100 days before that, I already you knew. Running yeah, I was a smart uh, surgeon uh, <laughs> at that point. I could, I could take steps and move quickly. Right. Um, the biggest problem the company had is they tried to outsource all of their functions. When I think of a company, great companies are like living, breathing organisms. What do I mean by that? Salespeople understand what the operational people are doing. Operations people are communicating with finance, finance with technology, technology with all of these. Everyone is interacting cross-functionally. Why is that important? If I'm a salesperson, now let's say I'm a good salesperson, but I've never been exposed to what my operational partner's requirements are. I could be out making commitments to clients that my poor friend Matt can't deliver on. So we end up having... It's a common problems. issue. A very common issue. So Matt, Matt can't deliver, he gets frustrated. Our client's not happy because he's not delivering and I'm, I no longer have credibility because I promised the client that Matt was gonna deliver. That's an example, but it, you could go across any, any number of different functions. So Excel Health, when I got there, had outsourced every part of operations um, so that these are all different vendors providing the service. None of them even knew each other. So that we knew one thing, they weren't talking to each other. And as a result, what we did, and we did it over the first 18 months, was backbreaking work, and um, hundreds of great people were right there with me, you know, 24 by 7 doing it. We would spend the day servicing our clients. Not very well, by the way. Um, service wasn't good, it was faulty, but we did the best we could from 8 until 5. Then our other work day began from 5 until the next morning at 8. And we'd go around the clock, and we were essentially building the capabilities to bring all of those, you know, fractured... Uh, vendor functions back into the company and actually building a company. We had a book of business of $600 million without a company under it. And so we built a company and it took us about a year and a half to do it and service came along positively as well. Well, the thing is, is you know, when, when companies grow a lot of times, they don't backfill with the infrastructure. But there's a couple of things that I think are really good mm -hmm. philosophically that sure. are, are worth capturing. One is, is there's a philosophy that the company has to understand, each position has to understand that concept of cross-functionality. Absolutely. How does your job affect everybody else's and how does their job affect yours? Living organism. Absolutely. And so people have to understand that. Something that I thought you said that was really cool, and as somebody that's very passionate about work ethic, I like you said a regular day ended at five and then our second work day. Yeah. And so often now what I hear is is that people, the, the, the common excuse I hear a lot is, is people don't have time. And a lot of times what I think it but means it is, sense. well, it's, it's what they're really saying in secret is it's not a priority because you can make, you can make time. I believe you can make time for anything, but you have to want to, you have to want to, how do you deal with somebody? Cause I know people are going to be watching this. They're going to be saying, if I told my people their second workday starts at five, everyone would quit. Okay. Um, you great question. And you can't just do that. I, I think you would fail if you did that. Yeah. So what if you had a CEO who actually got in the dirt and did the work with the lowest level people and was there at 2 in the morning or 10 at night or 5 in the morning uh, because the person uh, wasn't available to work at night? What if, the, what if senior leaders actually rolled their sleeves up and got in and helped the people in lower levels in the company? What if senior leaders asked those people, what is it that's keeping you from being better at what you do? What kind of changes can we implement that make your world more satisfying, more productive? You might get those people feeling a sense of loyalty to what you're trying to accomplish. The other thing you have to do is be honest with them. The entire company was unaware when I got there that the company was losing money. They thought the company was doing great because it was growing. Right. What did I do? Against probably some advice of other, other people that were there that said, oh, you can't do that. I held an all-employee meeting, pulled everybody in all day. The first two hours was my presentation to them to tell them that we're losing $150 million, that we have never made money in the 11 years of the company's history, and that we have to make and take dramatic steps to change it. Now, was that a risk that people could run and hide and go find other jobs? Sure it was, but they already knew me for 90 days and they knew I was probably not like what they were used to. And they were already excited about the things we were trying to accomplish, but now they're finding out that their house is on fire. And so it leaves them in a predicament. 
But I, my feeling was, if you're honest with people, they will listen to you. If you understand their issues and make ardent attempts to fix their work environment so that they're more productive and that they've got more, uh, more satisfaction, they'll start to care about what you're doing. If people believe in what you're doing, people will do amazing things. People can accomplish things and it's almost like a drug that feeds on itself in terms of camaraderie. People thought it was cool to be on the weekend club. It was cool to be at the evening club. Imagine that. <laughs> when, the, when the pizza showed up at 11 o'clock, mass email went out and you had 150 people all coming down having pizza. You know, a couple times that surprised them and we'd have beer. We'd have, you know, we just, we'd have that show up and people got, you know, it just became, it was part, it was like a pep rally environment. Now, that, that sounds self-serving for me to say that and talk about my situation, but I have been in good management uh, situations and bad ones. I've been in great cultures and I've been in horrible cultures. And to me, um, every company, you don't have to be a turnaround situation, it could be a well-performing company, but the quality of the culture in the company is absolutely a, a criteria or a denominator for how much a company can accomplish. I want, to, I want to hit on a couple of things really quick. Today, what's advertised is the four-hour work week. It's this philosophy that I should automate everything, um, almost that um, I don't have to be there, that everything happens automatically. And I, I just don't believe if somebody takes their spouse and they try to automate their relationship, I don't know that it's going to be a great relationship over time. And I think your philosophy is the exact opposite. I think that the public has been sold a bill of goods when it comes to hey, work less and accomplish more, and just kind of have everything, your investments all pay you, yeah. and you're, get your team to work, and they're all going to do the work, and you can be on your right. yacht or wherever you want, and as long as you got your phone with you, you're good. You're the absolute opposite. What you're telling me, everyone who's listening is, stop figuring out what you're entitled to, and just get in there and start working, right. and, you know, and understand how to help people, and stop looking at what's your territory, what should you be doing, the lines of division, but you're actually getting in and doing the work. Yeah. Delegation is, you read a lot of management books and delegation has, has its role. Uh, uh, micromanagement is seen as a negative, delegation is seen as a positive. Um, neither are correct. You delegate when you trust and you know that the subject matter has been, is, is executable and that the people are qualified to do it. You micromanage when it's not. That's and any good manager is like a good helicopter pilot. I mean, the CEO has got to set the vision, has got to take the helicopter up, see the entire terrain and make the best call strategically. I always thought when I was in that role, how the heck am I going to make a good decision on the vision thing if I don't know what's going on on the ground? And so a good helicopter pilot is going up and down, checking to make sure that the basis for the strategy is still accurate. You know, and if it's not, you got to get with the people, you got to look at the data again, you got to confirm the strategy, and if there are changes, you make the strategy, then you get back up there and, and set the, the broader, longer vision. So I, it's, it's about being close to your business. You know, Matt, let me ask you a question, just as an example. You're in high school, right? Yep. I think you went to high school. I you did. Pretty sure I did. Did you have a locker? <laughs> I did. You did? Yeah. I won't ask you what was inside of it, but, <laughs> um, but what was the combination lock? No idea. Really? Well, I, I had a locker. I don't remember my combination either. And the reason is because we've been away from our, our lockers for a long time. So how accurate would a, would a person who sets strategy be if they are away from their business for a long time. You've got to be close to people, you've got to be close to the issues in your business so that you can make your best decisions. So get really close to, to the things that you want to make sure inspect what you expect right. is what we say. But right. um, I've always had this philosophy that the more you want to change something, the more you have to measure it. And if you're up and in there with the team doing the work, you're measuring in a second by second basis, not in a monthly report by quarterly report basis. Right. So you can affect change really fast and also change the course of the business. Um, there was something else you said that I really liked, which was you had people that, if I heard you right, were working like late hours, mm -hmm. excited to get pizza, maybe beer every now and then. But I think the thing is, is I think a lot of people listening to this are probably shaking their heads going, yeah, not my team. And I actually think that's the prevailing thinking, and I, I could be wrong, but there's a philosophy behind that. There was, there's a cause that people are fighting for, almost something that I, I imagine, and, I, and I'm going back to something you had written in your book, which was really about looking back on your accomplishments. So mm -hmm. talk about the philosophy there that you, that's yours that sort of comes into the company. Yeah, 
I think being close to the business is really about being close to your people. I, I think the best, the best cultures, the strongest cultures are ones where people work well together. Now that, that sounds generic, but it's a really about trust and about openness. Um, if someone, if an employee makes a mistake, if it's a punitive culture, they're not going to tell anybody they made the mistake. They're going to say, hey, it wasn't me. If it's a, a culture that says, hey, show me the landmines, don't let me step on them. I don't care if you're the reason that caused the problem. We need to get at all the problems. Tell us where they are so we can address them. And that's just about process improvement, but what it comes with is trust. And to me, uh, any winning culture at its core is about trust and about making people at all levels feel a part of the team. If they feel a part of the team, it's not hard to, to ask them to stay and work extra hours because they feel like they're letting the team down. So I like that. I like that philosophy a lot. And I had a teacher who actually would show us the test, and this is back in high school, I do remember this, would show us the test and say, here's the test you're going to get. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not an open test, so you're going to have to come back and be able to, to answer this in long form. Right. But here are all the questions. So you were kind of doing that. You're like setting them up for success rather than setting them up for failure and then pointing out the failure. Which well, and then they own it. There's, there's nothing, I, I have not found uh, good quality human beings that don't get satisfaction out of their own accomplishment and doing something a part of it. Is it management, Just set them up for that. Absolutely. They own it and they want it to be right. And if they mean staying an extra hour or two hours or three hours, they're going to do it because their reputation, they feel a, a reputational alignment with what they're working on. It's funny, we talk about this concept of most people need four strokes, four good feelings for every negative, which is where you my correct wife, them. My wife says ten. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's minimum four. Uh, but, the, the, but the point is, is that you're allowing them to get their satisfaction. Everybody need, has this need for recognition sure. and, and, and their identity needs it. And so you're allowing them to get that in a very productive way at work which I really like. Yeah, we, we, we trumpeted the good things. We, all, we also would pull out the, the, the mistakes and use them uh, for constructive feedback. But if you, you can create fun out of some very, very mundane activities. There's a lot of mundane activities when you're fixing a company or even when you're fixing a good a portion of a really good company. But you can make a game out of it set records on, on how fast someone can get through a certain set of projects and you can create teams and, and have them kind of play off each other and you know the team that loses has to has to serve lunch to the team that wins the next day. Just simple things like that that put a little a little life and jazz into the into the work day. Make the make the mundane fun. Absolutely. It's not, it's not, a little bit of thought goes a long way. There's there's a the last thing I want to wrap up on one of the concepts I really like in your book is the sixty five year old on the beach. 70 year old. 70, oh you've upped it. Inflation, <laughs> inflation. <laughs> and in, a, in another five years, 75 yeah. and then 80. Right. But looking back, yeah. this is important because I think one of the things I've heard throughout this interview and from other conversations we've had yeah. is it's almost the way you approach life. It is, and, the, it is the way. And yeah. it's a very different way. I think a lot of people are thinking uh, from a fear-based mindset or they're thinking from a very selfish mindset. You're actually thinking from a much bigger picture, but it's such a simple philosophy. I think if more people followed it, I don't care where you are. If you're the CEO, you're in private equity, this works. But Absolutely. talk about that philosophy. Well, it, um, it, this, is, this is also a personal philosophy, so it, it, it's certainly what uh, drove me in the workplace, but, but it, uh, as a person, my personal relationships as well. I always thought that I worked in every job for the 70-year-old on the beach. And when I was in college, I was taking tests and trying to, trying to do well because I had an obligation to the 70-year-old on the beach. In work, in business, the same way. All through every job, my boss was the 70-year-old on the beach. That 70-year-old on the beach is me many years from now. And I felt that I owed it to that guy to make as many of my activities and accomplishments throughout my life things that he would look back on and reflect warmly on. So it has guided me in, in my interpersonal relationships, it's guided me in, in every aspect of my life. It's just my philosophy, it's a, it may be a little strange, but um, it's a simple one that if I let that guy down, then when he's 70 years old sitting on a beach, he's going to have things that, will, that he'll think about and lament 
about that aren't as positive. And so it was something that drove me to try and do as well as I possibly could each and every time I, I you know, faced a challenge. So when you're making decisions, I would ask you that you include that thought process in your decisions because a lot of times your decisions are based on the now and getting a result in the moment, but just make sure that the way that you're going about getting that result is something you're going to be proud of later. And the thing I like is combining that with having fun in the process, meaning it's not wait to enjoy being 70. It's enjoy every moment so you can look back and enjoy all the good moments all over again, Absolutely. which I think is great. You know, how many people um, love to do a certain thing, a hobby, or be with their friends, or go golfing, or do something like that, and they can't wait to get there and, and have a blast? But if they're working, there's relatively little time in their life to do those kinds of things because you're spending 80% of your waking hours either working or worrying about work. Because Why? Because you have bills to pay. You've got obligations. And so I always thought, if you're going to spend 80% of your waking hours in this thing, it better be a lot of fun and with some high quality people. And that really was my criteria for where I would go and the kind of people that I would want to surround myself with. I mean, you know, life ain't no dress rehearsal. You know, we're all getting older every every day. Actually, I, I think I'm stagnated. I'm still 23. <laughs> but but life life is no dress rehearsal, and and uh, getting the most out of our our experience um, personally and professionally. Uh, there's no reason why it can't be spectacular. And work is a four letter word, but it can be a great four letter word. At least, again, the world according to me. So. Well, I like the idea of making work as fun as anything you're doing right now. I think a lot of times people think. Uh, when they get enough money, when they get enough whatever, then they can put work aside and do the things they really enjoy, but you found a way. And it doesn't mean you have to change your job. It doesn't mean you have to leave your company. It doesn't mean any of that. It just means how do you become creative in making things fun. But I think um, one of the things that I want to do is kind of have everybody uh, know what you're up to now. Sure. Which is, you, you've got a lot going on for somebody who's yeah. got a lot to look back on much later in like, I think it's like 40 years from now. Yeah, you know, I'll be 60, be 60 by then. Um, <laughs> I like that. That's good so math. It is. It's, it's optimism, right? It, it is. Um, by people's, most people's definition of retirement, I guess I did that five years ago. Um, but in the five years, I'm, I'm as busy now or more busy now than I was when I was working and I was very active then. Um, as part of a guide on, we talked about guide on earlier. Kind of part of part of the private equity firm with my partners. Um, that's been really interesting and fun, and working with, again with high quality people. Um, also, an options investor. I'm, uh, I write an investment newsletter, Dunlap Investment Newsletter dot com. That is a twice a month uh, publication. As Matt mentioned, I I wrote a book um, in 2015. Um, it's a leadership management book called The Dunlap Rules. Uh, my last name is Dunlap, but it's about the rules that were instilled in me by my parents. My father was a college football coach, absolutely one of the finest managers I've ever uh, witnessed. Um, and I took from the things that he did, which were building winning teams, winning cultures, I took those components and the methods that he, I, I observed him do over the years, and I tried to instill those in a business environment. Um, so uh, the book is a tribute to my parents, but I've had the feedback I get from people who've read it is they're like, oh, it's nice that you wrote about your parents, but this is a management leadership book. So Yeah, and you're uh, helping students. Yeah, and do, doing seminars uh, with about 400 students. I will tell you, my email and voicemail fills up. Um, it has become almost <laughs> a full-time job, but I, I love it. The kids are calling me all excited because they got the internship that they wanted um, or they got the job that they wanted. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a great way to, to give back uh, to some really talented um, young people. That's the type of person you're listening to right now. So uh, any parting shot, anything you want to say to everybody who's, who's going to be watching this? I've found it really what I did in my career, the what wasn't as important as, as the how. And the how is about how it feels, how the culture and the organization you're involved in. I was in healthcare. I could have been in oil and gas or ladies, ladies apparel. Um, it would have been the same experience because I would have searched for an organization where I feel there's trust, I feel valued, and I feel part of a team. And when people are, feel valued and part of a team, they're willing to give more because the loyalty level is high. Um, and so whether you are a manager or someone who, who is not a manager, um, my, I guess my ardent 
um, hope is that you're able to find uh, a culture that's a winning culture in an environment where you feel great about the people you're around um, because that's what, to me, that's what life is all about. It's about being happy and feeling fulfilled. So thank you for your time today and uh, maybe we'll see each other again. Fred, thank you very much. I hope you took great notes. You found one thing that you can go apply that's going to make a huge difference. I know these principles made a huge difference for you. Again, I want to thank you for being here and Absolutely. to your success. All right. Thank you.